Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next talk in the Data Science Track PyCon 2020. My name is Tamara Tungvist, and I will be coordinating this talk. In this talk, we will hear Ole Green. Ole is a tech author and a founder of DataAlliance.io. Ole will talk about the incredible algorithm called GPT-3. The floor is yours, Ole, and we take the questions after your talk. Sounds good. Thank you for that, Tamara. Okay, let's get into it straight away. Um, I basically structured this talk to give the most kind of value if I were interested in knowing more about GPT-3. So this is the agenda for today. First, I want to give some background to why GPT-3 basically has been developed to what it is today. Then we want to take a look at the fun stuff, the code. After that, we want to move in to see some projects, both from the community that has been working with GPT-3, but also some personal products that I've been using and in our company, Data Alliance.io. And then we can discuss a few of the problems and the future, and then we'll finish off with a few minutes of Q&A. First of all, who am I? My GPT-3 credentials is that I have been a become a machine learning author this summer, where I published a book using GPT-3. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. I've been also to Stockholm University, been a guest lecturer talking about applied machine learning and data analytics. And then I also founded an AI company. Basically, this is Data Alliance.io, and we help organizations use AI and machine learning for business insights. Nothing really extraordinary about it. We just want more companies to use machine learning to get better business insights. And the fun part here is that we have used it for three different cases for clients where GPT-3 has been involved. First one, email generator, where we assisted an airline company to reduce time spent emailing. Then we talked about a cover letter generator, where we helped two American PhD students to get a data scientist job at Google. Basically, it was generating a few different cover letters based on a few criteria that they had in their job description and generated good cover letters that they can adjust for their own liking. And then we made also a uh, web app called Simplify that we can take a look at later on, where we basically put very complex paragraphs of text and then make them way easier to digest. We will look at that later. Now, GPT-3. OpenAI is basically the company that has produced this amazing machine learning algorithm. And this was founded in 2015 by Elon Musk and Sam Altman. And for you guys who haven't heard about Sam Altman before, he's the former president of Y Combinator and also now the CEO of OpenAI. And I think many of you guys have heard about Elon Musk before, which has been pushing in millions of dollars in investments into this project. Basically, what the whole mission of this open AI company is, is to ensure that artificial general intelligence is pushed forward where highly autonomous systems outperforming humans at most economically valuable work and benefiting all of humanity. So that's basically the background to the company. But let's talk about a few things that they've done that I think is pretty important to mention. They have done, for example, a robot that sold a Rubik's cube using their artificial intelligence algorithm and a machine hand. They have also done a algorithm that can take half a picture and then generate probable or plausible kind of next half of the picture, as you can see here from the birds to the elephants to the houses. And then also maybe the most, what do you say, the most popular thing that they have been recognized before about was when their Dota 2 AI com well, open AI 5, as it was called, learned by playing 10,000 games against itself, uh, or for, what do you say, 10,000 years of gameplay against itself, where it demonstrated to basically perform expert level performance and learn these kind of human competitive, um, what do you say, human competitive kind of level of uh, gaming performance. And this resulted in them basically winning against the world champions team OG. So the repertoire of this company is pretty impressive. And now let's dive into the thing that I find most important and most significant here, which is the GPT-3 and GPT models. So this started off in 2018, when we had GPT-1. 
where this is basically an unsupervised learning algorithm that they pushed a lot of data in training it. So why we chose or why they chose unsupervised learning is that we can see that supervised learning at its core is most recent success of machine learning. It's a problem with supervised learning because it requires a lot of large, carefully cleaned and expensive to create data sets to work well. So unsupervised learning is attractive because it's potential to address these drawbacks. Since unsupervised learning removes basically the bottleneck of explicit human labeling, it also scales well with the, human, uh, with the current trend of increasing compute and basically available raw data. And here, basically what the model did was it kind of helped out in a few different scenarios. So uh, the COPA test is basically designed to test common sense reasoning and reading comprehension. So here in GPT-1, with very little tuning to the overall model, they could see that when they asked the question, the man broke his toe, what was the cause of this? It had a very high likelihood of choosing the right answer of, he got a hole in his sock versus he dropped the hammer on his foot. He probably didn't break his toe using a hole in his sock. He probably dropped a hammer on his foot. So overall, this generated pretty impressive results two years ago, given a very small amount of data training on it. However, it was also showing some flaws to it so far because it needed some more compute, they need to scale the approach and improve the fine tuning overall. And that's where in 2019, they used GPT-2, where they had 1.5 billion parameters and trade on 8 million web pages. And it was basically the same goal, predict the next word, and it gave overall quality given input that was more impressive than the first GPT-1 model. And then, of course, we couldn't stop there because in 2020 now we generated GPT-3. And this is, in my opinion, of course, the most impressive model of it so far. And for some scale and for some kind of comparison here, we can see the parameters used in before. So it's quite extensive kind of training that has been done using this model with 175 billion parameters. But now, what, what does it actually tell us? What does this do? Basically, if there's something you need to take away from this talk is that GPT-3 is basically generating text by guessing the next most probable word. And now, with a little bit of backstory that we've gone through now, let's move into the fun stuff, which is basically the code. So if we look at the first thing here, when you have access to the API of GPT-3, you can import OpenAI, and you can basically give it a text prompt. In this case, we want to make it look at poor English versus kind of the correct English. So poor English, for example, would be here as one example in the middle there. She no went to the market, and the corrected English would be she didn't go to the market. So in this case, we just gave it two kind of, this is the wrong answer, this is the right answer. And then we have in line 10 there, the poor English being, thank you for picking me up as your designer, I'd appreciate it. We see that something is maybe a little bit wrong with I'd appreciate it there. But then we ask the algorithm instead, instead of making our own assumptions. So when we generate this, we put in response, we use the Da Vinci model that we will talk about in the next slide. We then generate the prompt, we have a max token of 300 tokens, and then we print it. And the output basically gives us is, thank you for picking me as a designer. I appreciate it. So basically, as you can see, with 16 lines of code, we have basically created a kind of grammatically correcting program that you can implement as kind of like a web app or whatever you like. So the sheer potential of so few lines of code is pretty damn impressive. Now, in my case, when I used this, uh, when I wrote the book this summer, there was a few different parameters that I wanted to take a more specific look at. And I think it's also interesting for you guys to take a look at more as well. So here's like the more elaborated kind of way of looking at the code here. So if we're looking for line 15 down to 28, basically. So 
first we use the different kind of engines. So you can use Da Vinci, Ada, Babbage, and Curie, like a few different ones. Da Vinci is the more prominent one and the impressive one. Then we can select how many tokens, like how long do we want the result to be? In this case, we choose 500. And then we have three different ones that I find super interesting to talk about. Temperature is basically about how much creative risk we want to take here. So, for example, this is a number between zero and one, and it determines the creative risk that the engine wants to take when generating text. And this is, of course, going to depend on what kind of product you're doing. Sometimes you want it to generate some very kind of new ways of thinking about the problem than the kind of prompts that you have given it before as the kind of wrong way and the right way or whatever it could be. Frequency penalty is basically effort in not repeating itself. So once again, if you're giving it a few examples to follow, you can make the algorithm to say, no, I want you to, well, for sure, look at this, but I want you to really try to find some new way of kind of explaining this or writing this out in the results. And then finally, the presence penalty, which is about talking about new topics. And we're going to go more into that when I'm talking about my book specifically, because it can generate some very interesting results overall. So this is basically it. The code is really short, and this is the NLP model that we're talking about. Now, what is this actually capable of? I want to look at a few community projects that I think are pretty impressive and important to take a look at. The first one being by OpenAI, uh, which is basically text to Python. So in this case, the program we write this definition of is palindrome. And in this case, the palindrome, <coughs> <coughs> in this case, the palindrome is basically where you have a word that is the same when you see it from, from the front and from the back. And we write this function, and then we write a text command here, or like a string, where you have check whether a string is a palindrome. And then we basically get this result. So the algorithm is generating this code of uh, this string of code for us. So let's just think about this again. So like, is this really impressive? Not really. Like we can look at Stack Overflow probably pretty easily and find this. So like a quick Google, ah, maybe not that impressive. However, this is where it gets interesting. Let's say now that we actually have a new uh, function here that we want to return a list of indices for elements that are palindromes and at least seven characters. The result we get from this now is actually not only a correct kind of code snippet that we get for what we have asked the GPT-3 program to give us, but it is at the same time, you can see here, giving us something special that we can't get from Stack Overflow, which is basically that it's using the function that we used before, is palindrome. We're going to, of course, talk a little bit about the flaws of the, the potential strings that we get from this, because this isn't always going to give the perfect answer. But you can just think as a coder, the possibilities here, if we can get some general kind of estimate that it should be close to the final answer, and then we maybe need to tune it. How much more product, uh, like how much higher our productivity can get using this in combination with our programming skills. So it's pretty impressive in that sense. Now let's move on. Text to SQL code in a similar way here. We select like, for example, how many users have signed up since the start of 2020 from an SQL database. Then GPT-3 here, uh, based on the project from Farash Nishtar, it selects count ID from the users where it's created since the start of 2020. Next thing, also, if someone here is interested in finance, this is something that kind of caught me off guard when I saw this. This is basically a program here where you're generating a balance sheet and adjusting transactions in the balance sheet with your regular text. So in this case, two things happen, for example. 
we see here first that tell me about your transaction and we say that we put in $20,000 in cash into the business. The result being it added to $20,000 within cash. And then we know if we're been to accounting or done an accounting course that we need to add it to the owner's investment of $20,000. And the next thing, tell me about a transaction where we prepaid $900 for the rent for the next three months. It basically puts one in prepaid expenses and then remove $900 within cash. And once again, you can see the kind of potential here of automating this kind of stuff for small businesses and using this as a web app in a sense. So the potential once again becomes quite clearly pretty, pretty significant. Let's move on. For example, if you're into engineering and academics, like for example, I'm writing a few uh, papers in latex. Matt Schumer did a program here where you're basically using your regular text and translating it into uh, latex formats and uh, like mathematical uh, equations. So in this case, integral from A to B, yada, yada, and you get the actual output from it there. And another way, web design. This one I think is more concrete than like the most concrete thing we can get. Because basically here, we're asking it to generate pricing section with a light background. Main pricing is $52 per month. Pricing perks are 24 support, all features, equity. We mentioned a few things here. And we mentioned this also for some other categories are 12 and 25. And this is basically generating a web page, a part of a web page for us. So once again, in web design, getting this kind of like a generated template from your text, how you want it to be, can be quite damn impressive as well. And then of course, tweak it afterwards. But just getting this kind of code to this place is probably gonna take someone like maybe 30 minutes. And now it just takes a few seconds. And then the thing that I'm getting most excited about in a sense is of course the machine learning aspect because using a machine learning algorithm to generate machine learning algorithms, come on, can it become even cooler than that. So in that sense here, we basically ask the model to build a Keras model to classify images into five groups. The data set has 25,000 images with an input shape of 500 times 500. And it generates a generic model for us. Of course, this is probably not gonna be perfect for your application, especially if you're like in an enterprise situation. But once again, it's more about like just generating the code getting it out there and then tweaking the models in itself later on. Once again, increase in productivity pretty substantially. Now, okay, I gotta be honest with you. GPT-3 has basically shifted my whole priority list in my GitHub repositories because it's been just too much fun to be working with. So first thing, that has been I've been doing is basically writing a book that is about the robots that we basically took a story about a giraffe called Ginger and we asked the GPT-3 model and said hey could you generate a story about a giraffe called Ginger and then if you're doing that this is the kind of output we want and then the next part we basically asked it for generate a story about a robot named Bob. And then it gave us a big chunk of this kind of uh, book that I wrote here. Of course, some tweaking needs to be made or was needed to be made here. But in a general sense, adding things such as, for example, that Bob the robot had a general theme of helping a young kid to find his father. He was going to travel to different planets. And at those planets, those were represented by Greek mythology, um, mythological gods. So in, for example, Neptune, you have Poseidon representing that planet, and then the god will be there to help them. Adding those little things, and the GPT-3 model picked up on this. So when I asked about Mars, then he generated the god that was represented in Greek mythology. So it really starts to pick up these things pretty quickly. Um, and once again, you can find the links here for this book. It's on Amazon. It's also like a free PDF version given these times in Corona as well. So this was a pretty fun project. 
I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a few slides. Then, again, it's also a fun way to generate medium articles. At least here at datalines.io, we thought it would be fun to make it a little bit of a machine learning exception here, because of course we got to make GPT-3 write about deep learning algorithms and reinforcement learning, like what is it? So we asked it basically to generate text, but what is deep learning? Can you give some examples of it? And what are some expectations for the future? And yeah, I got to say, it's generated a pretty good amount of good text here. You'll find a link here in the slides as well if you want to read the full thing. Of course, some editing was needed, but pretty impressive once again. And then we did a simplify app. A few other seed creators have done a similar thing as well, where you basically take a complex text, you put it through the model, and it generates a simplified version of it. So here for quantum physics, it's talking basically about it's strange stuff. We don't even know if it really exists. Some people still believe that quantum physics is what makes parallel universe exist in a way. So very simplified version. Now, with a limited time, I want to basically talk for the remainder here about some limits, limitations to this, and also the future. Because what is the biggest flaw with GPT-3? Well, from what I've seen from experience here and a few other like Google data scientists that have been talking about this, it's basically the bias and unreliability of the output. So for example, when I was writing my book this summer, the storyline about Bob the robot helping a young boy to find his father, needing to travel around the universe and meet different Greek gods to find him. It's kind of a family friendly story. However, with our different parameters that we needed to tune, when it wanted to be extra creative, it sometimes turned into, put it mildly, a Stephen King horror novel, which isn't, of course, compatible with a kid's story. So, if you're expecting this to always produce some really, really specific stuff on maybe like an enterprise level, it could very well disappoint you. Of course, this is really good when you want to learn a few, uh, what do you say, uh, learn new tasks when it's good at giving a few examples. So a worthy thing here to mention is that we can see that when we give it a task, it basically looking through its training data instead of developing a new model to find an answer. So it's recognizing the task instead of really dissecting it and developing a model for the specific task. So basically here, we're arguing that this kind of intelligence in this model is associative memory. Now, we see that it's based on data, the answers, instead of developing these new ways. And it can produce some pretty significant results right now. And we see that the upcoming versions of this will be more and more kind of context aware and be able to create more and more impressive results. And I want to mention something that Francois Cholet, the author of Deep Learning with Python, framed this in a really good way on the Lex Friedman podcast by saying, it's only constrained by the plausibility and not other important things such as factfulness or consistency which is why it's so easy to generate things with GPT-3 that are untrue or even self-contradictory. So basically the training time that we talk about here of these deep learning models will not be the bottlenecks, the efficiency of the models or the size. The training data in the final end will be what is gonna be the constraining part to this. And that's maybe hard to even digest, it's, at least it was for me when I realized this, given that we're talking about 175 billion parameters currently, and we're gonna need a lot more to make it even more um, impressive in the upcoming years. So also again here, I wanna emphasize that enterprise level applications might not be the kind of full possibility here, but from what you've seen previously here in the examples, we do see some pretty, cool projects, if not on enterprise level, at least on a personal level, which I have found very interesting to work with. So how do you proceed if you want to learn more about this? I would recommend going to openai.com, join the waitlist and play around with this when you get access to the API. 
They do have also a pricing for all of this that I recommend to go to their website if you want to push this to an enterprise level. I think it's Microsoft that has done this and Reddit has also purchased a part of this. Um, also, if you want to know a little bit more about these different products that I talked about, I do have a YouTube channel and you can see a few snippets of the videos over here. Uh, and also I do find a lot of really good medium articles that I've been re re writing very extensively about how GPT-3 can be used in different scenarios. So I highly recommend that as well. And with that said, that's pretty much all I got for today. And uh, thank you for listening. And I'm going to open up for any questions you might have. Cheers. Thank you so much, Ole. That's, this algorithm, this GPT-3 algorithm, is indeed something very incredible. So um, I just would like to remind our audience that there is a possibility to ask questions. Just uh, type them in the comments and um, Ole will answer them. So far, we haven't got any questions, but I have a question. So I'm wondering, in your opinion, what is the best and uh, what are the best use cases uh, to use a GPT-3 algorithm for businesses? Well, so I would basically push for a similar way that the way I've been using the model currently is that you're not relying it for critical parts. You could use it as maybe, for example, an idea generator. Uh, you could, to some extent, maybe use it for chatbots, uh, maybe internally or something like that but not push it towards, for example, the uh, consumer end of your chatbots, to say. Mm. So more focus in on like maybe idea generation, like for example, when we had the code snippets here, if you have a lot of like coders that you want to make a little bit more productive, I can see some implementation to this and having them being helpful to just write a string of text that you want code-wise, and then you actually get a kind of hopefully a close to the final answers snippet of code. And then they, as they are probably very good coders, they can just see, okay, we need to change this and this. So it changes, of course, like you're not writing the code from scratch. That might be one thing that's maybe not 100% the best thing, but it depends, I think, on the application. So generation of ideas and text is the main thing here. Great, thank you. So now we got some questions. The first one is, uh, can this algorithm create Swedish text? Yes, okay, Kalle, thanks for that uh, question. So the thing here, once again, is to realize that this is basically using a big chunk of the whole internet. So in a similar way that they can create like translator apps with just a few snippet of codes, um, from what I've seen, and with a few testing applications myself, it can generate like Swedish answers as well. Uh, although, as we know, English is kind of the big chunk of the internet language wise, um, it might not give as precise a result because you don't have the same kind of data sample size to base the answers on. Um, it definitely isn't, uh, what do you say, non existent, so to speak. Hope that answers okay. your question. Great. Uh, we have also um, uh, a comment. The, the person who asked it uh, highlights that it's um, a comment, Ooh, not a question. So data to open AI was limited to a set of heroes and items. It can't be the world champions in the full game. For example, invisible heroes. Yeah. So. Good comment there, Botton. Um, I think mainly the whole point of this to a certain degree here is not maybe about the full extent of like if it can be, for example, their own esports team using these algorithms. Um, it's more about the kind of potential because given these constraints, it still outperforms the world's best Dota 2 players. So I agree with you, like it's not the kind of all kind of, uh, what do you say, um, uh, like we don't know how it's uh, applying to different like patch changes and that kind of stuff. So it's not maybe the most optimal one if you want long-term success. But uh, I think just bringing that up as an example is the kind of 
realize that it's not only chess anymore. It can be these kind of like MOBA strategy games as well. So it's kind of reaching out to more areas that we maybe haven't thought about before. At least me as a MOBA player thinks this is a, at least a pretty cool concept. <laughs> but I agree, currently we, the humans seem to be a little bit more superior. <laughs> Great. So our next question is, can you claim copyright on other texts that has been repurposed from the internet? This is, oh, oh God, I love this. Because this is such an interesting point of how this is basically, I'm, I don't know if it, this is a tangent from the question, but when it comes to like creativity and when you're basically reformatting text, as you say, Hugo, is it really your text? Like if you're using, 100 and like 10 Stephen King books as a data set for generating a new novel, it becomes a huge success. Can you still use that? And I don't know, to be frank, that's up to like legislative copyright or like uh, the government basically to an extent on how formal we're gonna go with that sense. Um, but currently it's also hard to prove in a sense that you have repurposed text from the internet. So. In theory right now, it seems to be that you're able to use these kind of data points and generate something that is new in a sense, but then again, it's just repurposed text. So it's a really important distinction here as we talk about this, like in the future, this could basically be like a new way to be creative. You're basically writing new creative things, but you're not really being creative. You're just putting it through a machine learning algorithm. So it's it's kind of diving into a very deep discussion about like creativity in a sense. Um, sorry if I went on a tangent there. I hope that answered your question, Hugo. Okay, so while we're waiting for other questions from the audience, I have one more question. So what's the price of using this algorithm? Uh, good question. Uh, I would say that OpenAI has, um, up their pricing on their website and um, i don't know it by heart currently but it's basically a few different tiers so you can use it for free uh, up to a few different tokens so basically up to a, i think it's like a hundred thousand tokens or like texts uh, or words so to speak so um in a sense, you can get started with this for free, and then you can scale up if you want to use this on like an enterprise level again. Um, and then you have pricing for that for how many tokens you generate given this API that you purchase, basically. So I think it's like a hundred dollars or something to the next tier, and then it just goes up to how much you want. And then you can contact OpenAI as well if you want some really extensive kind of Microsoft enterprise level as well. Then you could probably get a better price as well. Okay. Great. Well, I think we are done. No, we have one more question. Okay, so the question is, can this algorithm be used to detect whether texts are written by machine or human? Perfect. This is, I think, a little bit of an extension to the previous question we had. So currently, Xingfeng, it's really hard to see this in a similar way, like you have some sort of like, um, like you're basing it on such a large sample of text, it's really hard to identify where it's coming from. So in that sense, like seeing if it's written by a machine or human, currently I haven't seen any way of identifying that, which is kind of once again, a little bit of a problem here. Like are someone just repurposing other people's words and then making a profit of that. Is that an unethical aspect to it? I don't know. Um, it's powerful enough currently, at least, to make it difficult enough for us to identify it's a machine or human. So for example, if you want to test it out yourself, reading my book or like letting um, your uh, wife or girlfriend or kid reading my book about Bob the Robot and see if they can identify if it's written by a human or a uh, or a like GPT-3, like that's could be a start if you want to practice and test this. Great, thank you. Okay, I think we are done for this time. Thank you so much, Wally, for your interesting presentation and the audience for watching and asking questions.
Bye bye. Thank you, bro. Cheers.